Well, very good. Good evening, everybody. This is Dean, KK4DAS, uh, Vienna Wireless Society, uh, Chair of the Makers Club. Uh, we're here this evening uh, uh, for our kind of regular um, weekly meeting on our simple SSB project. Um, but before we uh, get to the project, we have a special guest uh, uh, this evening, um, uh, Pete Giuliano, N6QW, uh, Solder Smoke Podcast Hall of Fame, and uh, kind of homebrew hero for lots of folks out, out there. He's uh, built something over 50 transceivers over the course of many years and virtually every technology there is. And um, so for anybody that has ever asked me a question about why the rig is built the way it is, you got the guy here who designed it and he can answer those questions. And usually the answer will be, well, because I tried it and it worked. <laughs> so, 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 which is which is what we're trying to get to, right? We're trying to get to rigs that that that, uh, that work on the air. Um, so, uh, with that, I will turn it over to Pete. And Pete, as soon as you're ready, let me know, and I'll bring up the slides. Okay, okay, go ahead, bring up the slides. All right. So now we'll see if all my prep work actually worked here. Pete, can I start with a question? Where are you now? Sure. I'm in Newberry Park near Thousand Oaks, about 40 miles northwest of downtown Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Very Thank good. Call sign? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Your call sign? Look on the screen. Yes. <laughs> N6 yeah, N6QW. QW. It's easy, it's quality whiskey. That's all you gotta remember. <laughs> N6QW, quality whiskey. <laughs> quality whiskey, nice. Quality whiskey, yeah. Uh, kind of interesting. Well, anyway, uh, tonight I want to talk about the simple SSB transceiver, and um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, let me start off first by wishing uh, happy St. Patrick's Day to any of you who are Irish or any of you who want to be Irish. Uh, in the kitchen behind this wall where I'm, I'm talking to you from, on the stove, is a cauldron of corned beef with cabbage and carrots and potatoes potatoes and celery and what have you. My wife is part Irish and I do all the cooking. So she said, I don't care what you cook, but it better be corned beef and cabbage. So <laughs> when I finish here, we're going to sit down to a nice corned beef and cabbage dinner. Next slide, Dean. So I get often asked, how, how did you come around to building a simple SSB? How did this, this thing come about? And, and like a lot of things today, I had the time I've been retired uh, for about 20 or so years and uh, I had a lot of junk modules lying around and I got, was a little bit bored and so I said, okay, can I put this stuff together and come up with a complete transceiver and do it with the minimal, minimalist number of parts. So that's how the whole project came about. Next slide. Okay, okay so the important thing here is, uh, we're getting two slides at once. There you go. Uh, important thing about this, this all of my projects end up being an experimenter's platform. In other words, I build things in modules and I put things together and, and often the modules are well proven. Like I have a kind of a standard audio amplifier and standard microphone amplifier. And so I wanna build a transceiver. I say, okay, I got the mic amp, I got the audio amp. And often uh, times uh, I'll build a particular project and then I'll upgrade it. And so I have an extra module and I got a box full of modules. So uh, I'm always experimenting and uh, you'll always hear me talk about building things in modules. And the reason is if you wanna change something, you only need to change a module and you don't, you don't have to tear the whole thing apart just to make one change. You want a better mic amp or better audio amp. You just deal with that module, not with the, with the whole project. And uh, by all means, uh, you know, take a look at it, pick it apart. If you see something better, uh, have at it because it's built in modules as long as you match the impedance and you match the things that you need to match uh, you'll be you'll be okay it'll work ultimately and uh, I, I highly encourage changes because with what changes you know it's a continuous improvement project so um, uh, I know where Dean started out he started out with the basic uh, transceiver as I originally built it and and then he added a whole bunch of things to it so that's exactly what it's intended to do but real important is you, you need to learn what you're doing just don't build it I mean try to because it's chunked in modules it's easier to look at that module 
and understand how that module works versus looking at a whole big circuit board or a whole big schematic and trying to understand it. If you chunk it in little pieces, you can learn and understand what it's doing, what the functions are, why are there bypass capacitors, why, why do you have biasing resistors, and you'll find if you make changes, uh, certain things will happen. Uh, you get improvements or maybe you won't get improved. And the other thing is there's, there's no race here. Take your time. Uh, it's really important that you, you learn as you go along and just soldering stuff together is first of all going to probably result in not too good of an outcome. But if you take your time to learn what you're doing and take the time to, you know, be exercise a little care, you're going to, you're on a shorter path to success. And uh, Bill and I, Bill N2CQR, uh, who participated in the podcast, we always say, design it first, then build it. I mean, oftentimes guys build things, say, oh, yeah, maybe I better design this when they find out it doesn't work. And it's real important that you document what you do. And, and Dean, uh, I know I, he was always looking at, at uh, you know, voltage measurements, and he has a continuous record. So if you need to go back and fix something downstream, uh, you can go to your file, whether it's on a computer file or it's on a hard, hard copy file. You can look at pictures of scope patterns and say, look, that wasn't there before, or, oh, what I have now is better than what I had before. So it's really important to keep you on track. Next slide. Okay, we got, uh, boy, that's kind of interesting having the old slide and new slide on at the same time. I don't but know anyway, why that happens. Is it, uh, did it, did there, it come through? There you go, okay. Yeah, okay, there we go. Now, what I wanted to show here is some, some features and, and some things dealing with the construction. Up in the upper left-hand corner is, of course, uh, my, my front panel. And uh, I used a lot of recycled parts and recycled pieces. And actually that front panel was in another project and uh, I had it and uh, I, I did a little work here. Some of the controls are located why they're, where they're located because there were holes in the former panel. So I had to do a little <coughs> moving things around just to fill the holes so I didn't have a whole bunch of holes. So it sort of looks like it was, it sort of looked like it was put together with, with some plan but a lot of the planning was just what was formerly there and what was I able to use. But the, the uh, four line uh, display is, you know, it's nice to have a color TFT on this, but a four line display lets you, uh, lets you display a lot of information like that, that bottom line says Pete's 40 meter transceiver, you could put an S meter in there. I mean, it, that's one of the things you can do. So you have space to have an S meter, you see what the two VFOs are, you know what uh, mode it in up, upper side band, it knows the step tuning function. And then you'll notice on the, where it says VFOB, I've arranged it in the code. So when that VFO is working, you see it's on, that one's on. Now, if you went to VFOA, that on would disappear and, and VFOA would say on. Now, right next to it, in, right in dead center is, uh, is the bandpass filter. And that bandpass filter has got a couple of uh, trimmer caps, some fixed caps and two toroids. But what's important here is sitting right next to that bandpass filter is the bi-directional amplifier. Now in the original design, I used a pair of J310s that are configured as a dual gate MOSFET. And so that, that, that's actually mounted on a piece of angle stock. So then the final build, that's a vertical assembly, a vertical assembly. So the bottom <coughs> part of the angle stock glues to the place, screws down to the base plate and that stands vertically. And notice at the bottom of the bandpass filter is a short piece of coax and that coax actually goes to relay. And I came up with a, a system, and I'm gonna cover that a little bit later here in a subsequent slide. By using one amplifier and using a couple of relays, I can change the signal path so that on receive, the signal is coming from the antenna through this amplifier through the bandpass filter. And on transmit, the signal goes through the bandpass filter through that amplifier to the linear amplifier stages. So by arranging it this way, they're really short and close coupled. Now, right below that, you'll see a 2-22-19. That is essentially the same exact circuit, only it uses a single transistor and not the two J310s uh, arranged as a dual gate MOSFET. It's got the two relays and it does the same sort of thing that you're able to reverse the direction. So 
on receive, it's a uh, receiver RF amplifier. On transmit, it's the pre-driver. So um, the, the idea here too is to keep the connection short. Now in the upper right-hand corner is the bilateral amplifier module. And there you can see the filter. And uh, have you gotten your filter assemblies in? Yet? No, but I got, the, I got the shipping notice from, uh, from Tony in the UK. So they're shipping and he charged my credit card. So I'm pretty sure they're on the way. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, this is just a general arrangement, and uh, if you look in the lower right hand, or lower left hand corner, that's the receiver transmit mixer. On the lower right hand corner is the balance modulator product detector, and in between you've got the the two bilateral stages, and you've got the uh, nine megahertz filter. That's the GQRP filter, which is no longer available. Straddling either side of that filter are a couple of relays, and those relays do a couple of things. The one on the left hand side. That actually switches the, the voltage in the circuit. You see the gray wire there going right down the center of the board. That's so that that powers that on to switch the direction of the bilateral. In the, in the normal pass, it goes from left to right. And when you energize that relay, the, the voltages switch the direction of the amplifier so it goes from right to left. Now on the right-hand side, just above the uh, ADE1, which is the balanced modulator product detector, you'll see, you can just barely see it under the wires, is a, an inductor and two caps. That's a low pass filter because when you do the mixing process in the ADE1 at, at the product detector, you actually get two frequencies. One of them is audio and the other is the sum of the IF, which is nine megahertz and the sum of the BFO is 18 megahertz. So that's why you have that low pass filter that you only wanna pass the audio signals. Now. You'll notice that if you look closely at the far end of that little low pass filter, it goes up to the relay contact. And if you look at the uh, left hand, the right hand side of the relay at the bottom, there's a, it looks red, but it's an orange wire and the yellow wire. Uh, the orange wire is the normally close contact. So that means that connects to the input of the audio amplifier. And then the yellow wire connects to the output of the microphone amplifier. So I use kind of a color code Anything that deals with receive is orange. Anything that deals with transmit is yellow. Anything that's red means it's powered all the time. So later on, when you go trying to troubleshoot something, if you kind of follow the color code, whatever you pick, it, it's, you're able to look at the circuits and say, oh, that's orange, that must be used in the receive circuit. So that's something I need to look at. In the lower right-hand corner is another assembly that's placed vertically in the, uh, in the final assembly. On the left-hand side is the microphone amplifier. And on the right-hand side is the audio amplifier. And that little slot in between is so I can run the orange and yellow wire right between that slot. So that the yellow wire goes to the output of the mic amplifier and the orange wire goes to the input of the audio amplifier. And if you look closely upper and on the right-hand board, which is the audio amplifier up in the left-hand corner, right up there, it's another one of those filters another one of the inductors and the two caps. And the reason is this board was used in another assembly, but I tried to keep, keep the circuits compact. So instead of just connecting to that, I built another one right on the main board and then did the switching with the relay. So in the center uh, at the bottom again is the 2N2219. And we're gonna cover a little, a little bit about how, how this gets switched between receive and transmit. And on the right-hand side is the IRF 510, the final amplifier. And the import here is I'm using the back panel as a heat sink. So I have an insulator kit and I cut away the circuit board and I uh, just mounted the uh, IRF 510 right to the back panel. And that works really well as a good heat sink uh, for the IRF 510. And of course that mounts onto a base plate. So then you're essentially the whole chassis of the, of the uh, transceiver is essentially a heat sink. But this is just an easy way and you can, you can spend money on a lot of heat sinks. It's good enough as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, one time uh, I built a, uh, I had a piece of uh, single-sided uh, PC board and, and the PC board was eight by 10 inches. And I just made, I just screwed the IRF 510 right to the base plate with an insulator kit. So the whole bottom of the transceiver is a heat sink. And copper of course is, is, is a better uh, conductor than aluminum. So it's a really super heat sink. That thing never gets hot. So just uh, some little tricks that you learn as you go along. So the next slide, please. Just to let you know as well, I use an old Pentium heat sink 
for IRF five ten amplifiers. They do really good. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you use what you got. You know whatever's ha hanging around. Yeah. Go ahead, Dean. Next slide. Should be coming up. I, I love IRF. That before that's pretty oh, slick. That IRF five ten slick. amplifier. Those IRF five tens are shockingly good transistors for power amps. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the only thing is, with using the same circuit and just changing the bias level, a the Mitsubishi RD 6 HHF1 will plunk right into that circuit. Except you got to look which the uh, tab is the emitter, uh, not not the collector or not the drainage. You have an RF510, but without any literally any circuit changes except raising the power level. Now the reason that you may want to consider putting the Mitsubishi in there. The RF510 works really well on 80, on 40, on 20, and then starts to drop off the cliff at about 17 and 15 and 12 and 10. So, you know, with the sunspot cycle improving and you're thinking about putting a transistor, uh, you know, putting a transceiver on say 15 meters or 12 meters, which is certainly within the realm, uh, you may want to consider swapping out that, that for a real RF device, it's just that the IRF 510 really the, the power level drops way off as you go up in frequency. Okay, this is the backside of the of the transceiver, and I, I want to show a couple of things here. Uh, you heard me mention about the um, vertical assemblies. On the left hand side is that assembly that's got the microphone amplifier and the audio amplifier. Left hand side, you'll see it sitting there vertically. On the right hand side of the main board is uh, the bandpass filter, and then the bi-directional uh, J310s, or the 2219. And the reason for that is, is it keeps the, the, signal, uh, the signal wiring very compact. You don't have wires two feet long. So coming out of that relay, and you can see the, the, the relay uh, just next to the filter there on the left-hand side, uh, you'll notice that uh, uh, the two, the orange and the yellow wire, of course, the orange going to the audio amplifier and the yellow going to the mic amp. And then right, right in the upper part of that uh, board, you see the ADE1 and uh, the coax feeding that is the BFO uh, signal in there because it's used as a product detector and balance modulator. And then on the right hand side, you see another ADE1 and that's the receiver and transmit mixer. And they, and the coax going there comes out of the, the clock zero. And the, on the other side, the to the product detector and balance modulator is clock two. Now, what's here is, is I built a unitized assembly for the um, SI5351 and the Arduino and the display. Actually, I, I mounted four pillars off the corners of the LCD and then made a base plate that matched the holes in that. So that, that whole assembly comes out. So I didn't use a Nano because I happened to have an Uno in a junk box. So I said, okay, I'll use that here. It's a good place to put it. But here's a really important thing to think about when you're putting this stuff together. If you look at the top of the Uno, it's the port so you can program it. You don't want to have that thing 180 degrees because the port would be on the bottom and you have no way of updating the program. So the port is on the top. So all I got to do is plug in the USB cable right into the top of that thing and I can modify the program. So give that some thought as you're putting your radio together is how do I get access to that Uno, Uno if I have to update the programming for any reason or make any changes. And so that's all a unitized assembly. If I take the four bolts out of the front panel, this whole thing will slide out. So uh, it's a good, good way to service it. The other thing too is on the right hand side, you'll see the little small board sticking up a little higher that's the uh, low pass filter. And you notice you got a piece of coax from that low pass filter that goes right down to uh, the important pins are pin six, two and three. So uh, pin six is the, uh, is the yellow or BFO. Um, pin two is where you put the signal in and pin three comes off uh, so that you go to the IF. And you notice that you have some pretty short, well, you can barely see them, some pretty short jumper wires in there to go right into the board. So. This was designed for manufacturing and assembly, DFMA. I mean, that was that sports car one time, I think it was the Lotus Elan. If you wanted to change the oil, I had to drop the engine. Well, if you wanna make some changes on this, 
uh, you have to uh, have to be thinking about, about, you know, how can I access anything? And uh, two problems that I ran into this, and I'm going to share with you now, and I'll put put this up to the camera. You notice there's a real small hole right here. Well, what that hole is, I had to put that in afterwards because that's how you adjust the mic gain. Right behind that hole is the pot that's on the board. So I have an access hole right here. If I want to adjust the mic gain, I just go in there with little uh, one of those trimmer tools and I adjust the mic gain. Now, I ran into a problem on the other side. And right here is right behind us is the bandpass filter. What happened was this is a, a metal chassis built out of some uh, stuff that's used for um, sheet metal for used in roofing. And the, the cores were too near this metal. And even though you tuned up the bandpass filter, when those cores got near the metal, it detuned them. So I said, how am I gonna solve that problem? So I have a chassis punch and I just punched a hole in there. So then once they were installed, I can go in with the trimmer or the trimmer tool and then trim, tune up the trimmer. So I put the bandpass filter where it needs to be. So sometimes you have to do things like this so that you have service access. So oh, don't be don't be afraid to do that. But I mean, you need to think about these things when you're building a, a radio, when you're putting it in a package. How do I get the things if I need to make adjustments? So this is this is this 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 was an afterthought about how to do that. I just cut a run hole in there, and I can access the trimmers, and I can tune up the filter. The other thing is I mentioned about co color coding of the wiring. Um, so it lets me look in there. Anything yellow has got has got a life with transmit. Anything with orange has got a life with uh, receive. And if it's red, it's carrying power. So uh, the other thing too, is you need to think a little bit about ventilation. Uh, some of these things uh, by themselves don't give up much heat, but, but you could be. And if you uh, put things in an area where a lot of heat would be generated, uh, you can affect it materially affect it. Like if you had hot right here near the Arduino, the Arduino is actually pretty good, but if it gets too hot, you're gonna affect uh, some of the operations. So these are things when you're putting an assembly together, you need to be thinking about when I put this thing in a box, uh, what makes some sense. And then I use common materials. Now, if you take a look at the back panel and you look, you'll see it's a piece of PC board. I used the other side and just painted it yellow. And you'll see it says N6QW 30 meter transceiver. That was a front panel of a 30 meter CW transceiver. It was in a, a QRP quarterly article. I don't do much CW operating and it soon fell all the way to canalization. So I had the front panel. So I just didn't peel the label off. So, uh, you know, uh, everything is salvageable and, uh, you know, look for a lot of common materials that you can use. And uh, Home Depot is your friend. You can be surprised what you can find there that uh, is very useful as you're constr constructing. The, uh, the sides are made out of this uh, sheet metal uh, that's used on roofing. And I just bent over one edge so that one edge, I have a small metal break and that, that stiffens, it's called hemming. It stiffens the metal up so it doesn't wobble back and forth, makes it really strong. And then color matters. So paint your, paint your project up. You know, the, a dull panel doesn't, it's not very attractive. You got a yellow panel or a blue panel, it sure catches your eye and, you know, makes your project look finished. So, uh, some spray paint, again, Home Depot is your friend. Next slide. <laughs> okay, a couple of things I wanted to cover here is first of uh, the 40 meter bandpass filter, uh, you could actually, if you have solid state design for the radio amateur, the, the Wes Hayward, uh, Doug DeMaul book, in one of the appendix, they actually have the numeric computations that you can sit down with a piece of paper and actually derive all those constants. You decide what the frequency is, how wide of a bandwidth, what the impedances are in each end, and uh, you can hand calculate. And that's a really good exercise if you have SSDRA. Or you could go into LT Spice and actually those coils, the uh, 2.2828 microhenry, those came out of actually was Hayward's design. So I started with those because you have to know the Q, the loaded Q and unloaded Q to be able to really work all the mathematics. And since the loaded Q values and unloaded Q values 
of L1 and L2 were known from that article, I said, okay, I'm gonna use those. Then I build everything around it. Now, there used to be a series of 10.7 megahertz uh, little um, IF transformers that were sold by Mauser and a whole bunch of other people. It was the 42 IF 123. And you could actually use those transformers here by eliminating C3 and C5. And actually they have coils on each end. So you have an input coil and an output coil. Those things were really slick. And as a matter of fact, Tony, when he was trying to redesign this thing was using those same coils. The thing's kind of neat about it is they have a fixed 45, uh, 47 picofarad at the base of the coil. You can just cut that out and then tack on whatever uh, whatever capacitor you want to make those things resonate throughout the hand band. As a matter of fact, there are a couple of articles in radio magazines that showed, had a table that shows you how to do it. That makes it really nice because the coils are shielded. So I wouldn't have had that problem with the toroids and the bandpass filter that I did because it was too close to the, the side of the chassis. If you had these little IF transformers, you could have just tuned them and it, it wouldn't have known the difference. It makes for a nice, small, compact assembly. But don't overlook the use of LT spice and simulation, and you may come up with a, a better design than this, but there was something slick about this particular design. And I encourage you to go to LT spice, plug that in, play with it, and decide what you want to do. But the slick thing is C1 and C2 is 150 picofarad fixed uh, ceramic on glass capacitor in, in parallel with a trimmer. If you pull out uh, the 150 picofarad out of C1 and C2, so that you're left with the 45 picofarad capacitor. Actually, C3, C5, and then the two capacitors that make up part of C1 and part of C2 are also 50 picofarad. You can retune that. If you make C4 a little, say, a, a 0 to 12 picofarad trimmer, you can retune that, and that then works on 20 meters. So with with essentially the same design, you could retune it to either be 20 meters or 40 meters. And Dean, you, you did that, didn't you? You you built the 20 meter? I did, I did. I built the 20 meter version oh. and I've got it switchable now. So, uh, and it's, yeah. this okay. it's this exact design with the trimmers in there. Hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, this this was, you may, you know, some may want to take that part and say, well, why didn't you make it a 19 or 22 or whatever? But it was, it was some of these, things are compromises, but in that case, the compromise was I could use the same basic design and just essentially pull out two capacitors and retune five trimmers and it suddenly went from 20 meters, suddenly from 40 meters to 20 meters. Okay, in the, uh, in the block diagram below, again, this is just to emphasize the fact of building in modules and uh, you can see some of the modules and one in particular is the, um, is the, bi-directional amp stage that was kind of kind of at the bottom near the left hand side and that used two j310s and the reason i want to single that out is if you look to the right and you see the signal routing this is kind of a slick way and you could do this with diodes although i prefer the relays you could uh, i want to just take a second to follow the signal if you look with at the on the left hand side where it says the normally closed contact you see an antenna input from the tr the amplifier for the J310 module or the 2N2219, doesn't matter. It Just look at it as a module. The signal comes from the antenna and passes from left to right through that module, then passes uh, across down up into the bandpass filter. So we got signal coming in from the antenna, goes through the amplifier module, and then ends up in the bandpass filter. Now, when I, when I hit the push to talk, the two relays switch. So now that relay, instead of being on the left-hand side and being, instead of being connected to the antenna, is now connected to the bandpass filter. And the, uh, on the output side, what was connected to the bandpass filter now goes to the linear RF amplifier stages. So two little small relays that I bought for 60 cents a piece, let me use that one amplifier to use it as the audio RF, amp uh, the receiver RF amplifier and as a transmit free driver. So that module can be the 2N2219 or can be the J310 or whatever you want to do it, but just something to keep in the back of your mind about how you can build one board and have two uses for it. Now, you, some guys have used diode steering. Um, there's some problems with that unless you use the right kind of diodes. Diodes that tend to work at RF, and then you still have, the, uh, you still have, to, you still have to provide 
source voltage to uh, steer the diodes, whether to the receive path or to the transmit path. So uh, this just to give you a feel, some things that you pick up and you use over and over again. I have quite a few transceivers that use that same signal routing, uh, steering it. So I have a single board that works both on transmit and receive. Next slide. Okay, you know, there is, there is a secret handshake involved with homebrewing, and I'm about to share with you the homebrew secret handshake. And this is, and I'm sure some of you are at this stage right now, before applying any power, check that you have the right part in the right place. Check that you have the right part in the right place. Check for shorts. Check for solder bridges. Check part polarities. You know, the NPN, PNP have different polarities. And so you, what you commonly think that the emitter always goes to ground on an NPN, ultimately ends up going to ground. But on PNP, the emitter goes to the voltage. So it's reverse. So it's real easy to get your mind always thinking about NPN. And you are using some PNP devices. So it's keep in mind part polarities. Same thing like on capacitors, electrolytics, and what have you. Check the power polarities. Um, this is a real problem. And one of the things that you want to do is, is think about reverse power protection. And the way in which you do that is you put a diode across your, uh, across your power input so that you, you would put it in such a way that if you have the voltage is reversed, the voltage goes to ground and you put an inline fuse. So what you end up doing is blowing the fuse. So there's lots of ways to prevent uh, putting the wrong juice in there because you'll smoke stuff. And there's nothing worse than watching your whole, <laughs> your whole project go up in smoke because you got the polarity reversed. And you can do some extreme. Like I, uh, in one radio, I put an extreme reverse polarity protection. Actually, the, the, the power to the radio is supplied through a relay and you can't engage the relay if the power is the wrong polarity so i mean i physically turn it on with a switch but if you got the polarity reverse the relay will not close and in essence what happens you you save the radio uh, also check for power connections there's a, a story behind this uh, i i had a project and the ham in the uk was building along much like the the club is doing here and I get these emails, your design sucks. It doesn't work. You know, I've tried this thing and it sucks. Uh, I get emails like that. And this guy had taken a picture of his board and on the board, he put voltage levels everywhere on the board. He made voltage measurements everywhere. And what caught my eye was he had the collector of one of the transistors and it had zero volts on it. I said, well, that's not good. And then I looked further there was nothing connected to that collector. There was no wiring connected to that collector. He was not supplying power to that collector, that transistor. No wonder it didn't work. And the clue should have been is he measured no voltage there. I mean, learn what you're doing. If you see no voltage on the collector, that's a big signal that something is wrong. Either you got a broken wire, you got a short somewhere, or you just didn't physically connect it. And then the other thing is you need to check for cold solder joints. Uh, I think you had a couple of those, didn't you, Dean? I, I have them almost every board I build. I have at least one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, something didn't work, and you had to go back and touch something. And so, oh, I was so, so and we all do it. definitely, I have been debugging and gone back and found a cold. It just, it actually just happened this week because I rebuilt the audio amplifier along with everybody else, and it was working one day, and then it wasn't working the next day. And all I did is tap down, I just, reflowed all the solder joints and it came to life again. Cool. Well, yeah, that's the thing. And, and, and the thing is uh, I have a real hard on about soldering irons. I have about 10 of them. I finally got a good one, but uh, some of these soldering irons, they're just, they're pretty marginal. And then do this a second time. Take a little break after you do this once. I mean, the, the whole lapse time for this might be 15 minutes. Take a break and go back and go through right part, right place, short solder bridges, polarities, power polarities, power connections, cold solder joints. 
if you use this process, you're, you're, it isn't to say it's going to give you 100% success every time, but it's sure going to get you close and you're sure going to save a lot of parts. Uh, I mean, you're going to, your, your burnt part uh, pile is going to go down dramatically if you go through this. And they go, of course, it doesn't hurt to plug and pray. Next slide. That is really fascinating, Dean. I've never seen that. I've never I'm, not, seen I'm that. not seeing it, so I don't. I, all I see is I, the slide change. Yeah, it doesn't. It does. It's just you got two slides at once. I don't know how you do that. Anyway, the, the whole, whole bottom line is having fun. And, and on this, you've seen this slide before, but it's just to show you, uh, you know, some of the things uh, that that are that are nuanced. Like uh, when I got the uh, Arduino uh, Uno. I get uh, some header pins and I get the right angle pins. It makes it kind of nice because you can just plug them into the uh, the Arduino uh, uh, Uno there and then just solder right to the pin. So everything will plug in and it's all unitized. Uh, I used uh, hardwire from the SI5351 to RCA jacks. And so if I want to service this or I want to do some additional work on it, I mean, I unplug a couple of wires, uh, unscrew a couple of uh, bolts and the whole thing pops out. So um, just kind of keep that in mind as you, you build uh, that, you know, you got to really think downstream. And as a matter of fact, I always say, uh, before you really even start building, you know how to think about what, what you're doing in terms of what, how this is going to go in an enclosure, because, uh, you, you know, it'll cause you to place things certain places. Like by design, I put the uh, main circuit board in the middle and then either side of it, is the two assemblies that, that work with that board, the audio amp and mic amp on one side, and then the bandpass filter and the bi-directional amp on the other side. And actually on the other, just downstream for that is the uh, transmit driver. So uh, you do this, you can get a fairly compact uh, package. Now I want to share something with you because the simple SSB is following a line. And I want to show you this. This is 16 cubic inches. And believe it or not, many of the circuits that are in the simple SSB are in this 16 inch box, 16 cubic inch. This is a 20 meter single sideband transceiver at one watt. And it's got the same uh, main board with the uh, plus C circuits. It's got a homebrew crystal filter in it. It's using the ABE ones as the balance modulator, product detector and transmit receive mixer. It has the same uh, microphone amplifier, same audio amplifier stage. The thing it doesn't have, it has a VXO in, in here instead of it's, it's tuning with this. It has two crystal frequencies that I can uh, stretch using the variable crystal oscillator. Instead, it doesn't have the Arduino and uh, the SI5351. But uh, I've used this on the air. And as a matter of fact, this was uh, subject of an article in QRP quarterly. This is the second one. I built a larger one. Uh, that, that was a little bit bigger, but this was intended to be a shirt pocket transceiver. And a few of these have been built around the world. So essentially what you see in your project is in here. And this is kind of a kick to, uh, to put this on the air. It only puts out about a half watt. It's about one watt input, but uh, you put, put a linear amplifier in this thing, you get 40, 50 watts and it's kind of a, kind of a blast. So uh, a lot of these circuits can be used over and over again. It can either in the simple SSB or it can be put in a box like this. So anyway, uh, that kind of concludes the presentation. I don't want to take up too much of your time because I know you want to start building stuff and Dean wants to cover a lot of material. Uh, I do have time. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them for you. But again, thank you for the opportunity to talk to your club. And I'm kind of excited that you're, you're going ahead with this project. I think you're going to find it, uh, uh, you know, very satisfying once you get it on the air. And the other thing, don't be encumbered by what you see. If you want to make changes, feel free to do so. I might suggest you might want to build it the first time as designed and then look at each one of the stages and see where you want to, might want to make improvements. The only reason it is, I know that the basic design works because it's been replicated by at least a half a dozen hams. So the basic design works. Now, is it optimum? Probably not. Is it subject to improvement? Well, of course. So get it working first and then take your modules out and improve them as you see fit. Oh, there you go.
Yeah, we've got time for some questions. What was the, the uh, Mitsubishi alternate the final transistor that you were talking about? I didn't jot down the number. Okay, it's the RD R, Romeo Delta 006. Hotel, Hotel, Foxtrot 1. RD6, RD006 HHF1. I strongly recommend you buy them from RF Parts out in California. And the reason for that is you can find some RD006 HHF ones out of China and you get them for about a buck a piece. The ones from RF Parts are real Mitsubishis and, and they cost about $4 and some change. But the ones you see for a buck, uh, I know a guy bought six of them and none of them work. <laughs> so just a word of caution. And, and the desirability is that, you know, even anybody that's built a microbitix, a uh, forehand will tell you it's rated at 10 watts, uh, the microbitix six, it's rated at 10 watts. And he says, 10 meters, if you get five watts, thank you, thank your lucky stars. So you can see how the power drops off dramatically. So if you're, you're looking to get a five watts on 15, 10, 12 meters, then the Mitsubishi is, is a, it's an R, it's a true RF device. And so uh, much better and it's, it's rated, you know, kind of flat gain to 30 megahertz. So Mike, one of the things that I'm gonna do um, when uh, I get my uh, head out of the water in this project is I've bought a bag of those and uh, on Pete's advice, I'm gonna build a dual push-pull amplifier as the new final stage. And we'll see what we can get out of that. So yeah. So, yeah, but Pete, um, I sent you a little private chat. Um, it turns out that uh, I was actually able to, so with a feedback loop, to 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 pull to make the uh, to make an IRF five ten uh, broadband from three to thirty megs, but you lose gain doing that. You get about fourteen dB of gain on it. But if you do a, put a, put a little extra boost on the on your input stage, you will get three to thirty megs and about five watts. But it, it it requires a feedback loop. There you go. Okay, well, well, share that with your club members, and that that'd be an alternative. I mean, the, uh, oh, okay, great. The IRF five tens are like eighty nine cents. That's a lot better than four bucks. I so, bought yeah, I course. bought six, sixty two bucks. I got a hundred of them. There you go. Yeah, Pete. Pete if you're going to stay on forty or um, forty or twenty meters, maybe is there any reason to mess with it, or can I just stick with my five ten? Oh, stick with a 510. It's not until yeah, after 20 meters. Okay. Yeah, not until after 20 meters it, that it starts to really get, it gets about half power, unless you do something special like putting a feedback loop in there. Right. Perfect. Perfect. By so the way, don't, five, don't get a you. five, and by the way, don't get a 530. 530 will run, even with feedback loops, it runs, it runs out of power 20 meters. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I keep reminding everybody for our build, Build what's on the sheet, <laughs> yeah. and for the and for later, do whatever you want. <laughs> because if you it's need an help, platform. <laughs> and if you need help, and I can't help you, Pete's getting an email. So, and if we're not building his circuit, he's gonna like I don't know. <laughs> Pete, how many of these uh, do you think have been built in total? Uh, the simple SSB. Yeah. Uh, probably. Probably ten or twelve that I know of. And that doesn't mean that ten or twelve total, but people have written me asked for. Well, I did a slick thing. Uh, if you go to my website N6QW, it has this project detail, and I say in there, if you want the code, you got to send me an email because I didn't put the code in the email, and that was a slick way for me to to know uh, if this thing is being built. And so I've had about ten or twelve inquiries for the code. Now. There was another project that's actually very similar to this. It's called Let's Build Something, uh, LBS. And it was a multi-part article in QRP Quarterly. And the architecture is kind of close, except we actually built double balance mixers. Scratch built them. So instead of using the ADE ones or SBL ones, you actually make it. And that I know, 70 have been built worldwide. And as a matter of fact, QRP quarterly told me that it was one of the most successful build projects that they ever had. They just the number of letters and correspondence that they got to inquire about it. 
So uh, I'd say that probably there's probably a dozen of these floating around. So Pete, if we are successful, we are going to double the number of SSBs yeah, out in yeah. the wild. Well, I'll tell yeah. you guys, uh, my, my experience, and Pete, you can probably confirm this. My experience is the number of times you're going to meet somebody on the air who is using a homebrew transceiver is close to zero. <laughs> so in about a year of operating this, I have never met anybody else on the air who's operating a homebrew transceiver. And I don't, how often do you run into folks like that, Pete? Uh, not too often. Yeah, so you're joining us. Usually, a... go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say you're joining a very select club of folks that have built, particularly single sideband homebrew transceivers. The uh, the thing I always find interesting, you'll you'll make an exchange, and I'll say I'm running a homebrew. The rig here in the center is a homebrew transceiver. That, that's such a a wonderful thing to be able to say, and then you usually get back. You know, it sounds pretty good for a homebrew transfer. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Pete. By the way, this, yeah, go ahead. No, uh, Pete, I think, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was amazing. You're, you, you are clearly knowledgeable about your baby transceiver. But uh, so I, I'm not experienced of building something such a complexity. Uh, and I was, I was looking at the value of the value resistor capacitor, they are all different. So did you happen to change some uh, components because it was not in the tolerance or because the filter part, it seems very precise values that you want there. So did it happen often that you have to change because the, the value are, is not the good one? Thank you for your question because you just hit on a very important subject. LT Spice. LT Spice is wonderful. If you learn how to use that, you have a little circuit in there and you say, look, it says for, it has a 3.3K resistor in there. I don't have any, I have a 2.7. So you plug a 2.7 in the simulation and you look at the curve and say, yeah, that'll work. <laughs> so I frequently, I frequently use LT Spice for that very same reason. Now, with bandpass filters, the precision components and higher quality components is really important okay. because you're trying to put some skirts on mm -hmm. the frequencies being passed. So, you know, you vary that pretty much from the design. You And that's why the trimmers are kind of nice because it lets you run them. And I, I should mention uh, a neat tool to get is a network vec vector analyzer these things can be had for about 50 bucks because once you build them, you slap them on the end and tune the thing up. Maybe, well, some guys in the club already have them. So once you get the filters built, maybe you have a chance that someone can run run your filter through their machine and you'll know. But you can, and that's that's really kind of cool because if you adjust the trimmers, you'll see how the output changes. But for the most part, use the LT Spice as a tool to say, look, I don't have any 10Ks. You know, that was the other thing of the L, uh, the let's build something. Uh, my co-author and I, and co-author who happens to live in the same town here, we designed it in a way that you use very few components of different values. We tried to pick like 1Ks, 10Ks, 100 ohms, you know, uh, 47 microfarads, 100 microfarads, 10 nanofarads, so that just by buying a stock of these, you pretty much had 90% of the parts to build it. So, but the, you, you raise a really good point. If you have the LT spice, that also enables you to learn about the circuit, but also see if I can make part substitutions without okay. actually building something. Thanks. I might add LT Spice has a very thorough library on an IRF 510. Pardon me for pounding on the same thing, but yeah. like, well, that's why I do a lot of, I, that's why I know about the IRF 510 so much. I've probably built about five or six amplifiers with that, with that transistor. It is a fun thing to work with. I, LT Spice has a full library of that part. Yeah, that's, that's a good lead into a question that I had about the bandpass filter and the low pass filter. I know in, in the schematics, it just shows a, a fixed capacitor, but it's certainly not a standard value. So I could see us putting the trimmers in and um, Dean, um, we have a, a procedure maybe of, of uh, dialing those filters in. We do, we do. And I'm, 
we're intentionally going slow, Wes. So I haven't gotten sure. to the filters yet. We're going to get. We're going to get to that. <laughs> and if you read the Word document that we put up, Pete has a write-up in that Word document on the filters that describes how you construct those filters with the trimmers. So it's in the Word document that's on the it's on the maker site. And and you have we have a term. It's a process called TFMS. TFMS, and that's tune for maximum smoke. <laughs> so, <laughs> one way you can do is pick the center of the band, fire up the transmitter, peak the trimmer so you get max output at the center of the band. That's that's a that's a quick and dirty way, but the VNA is a far more accurate way to do it. And we will for we have enough um, test equipment among our crew here. We have scopes, we have VNAs, we have spectrum analyzers that at the right stage, when we get to the point where we need those things, we'll be able to get to everybody and uh, let them, uh, let them uh, check out yeah. their, uh, their components that way. The after a DVM, what is the one tool that we uh, should shake our wallets for? One test gear thing. Let's go. A scope. Oh man, a oscilloscope, so. absolutely. Yeah. Now I I want to share a story with you because this will knock your socks off. Dean has got a really nice Rigel, a 200 megahertz scope. I have a 100 megahertz Rigel, cool. and 300 bucks. He got well. He got the 200 mega. You paid 300 bucks for that, right? I did. Yeah. He beats me. And so 300 need, bucks for a 50 meg scope. <laughs> So, I mean, you, you can get, you know, you can get a really good quality scope from a quality manufacturer. And, and that's, a, that's a, you know, I come from a time when $300 is a big ticket item. You know, kids today spend that in going out to lunch. And you know? so, oh, I, I but know. it's still a big ticket item. But if you get the right one, get the right one, uh, it's a worthwhile investment. And the thing is, the scopes in that range have other functionalities such as um, fast Fourier transform analysis. So you you got the FFT and you can look at, you know, put a signal in there and you see where the harmonics are. Yep. I mean, there's really interesting. They have Another frequency counters built in. They have the FFT built in. They have, the in. They have yeah. math functions. There's a ton yeah. of things you can do with these scopes. Yeah. Got time Save for one money. more question, guy. One more question. Yeah, I have, I have, Dean, I've got one comment. Go ahead, Lee. There is one advantage of another advantage of using the Mitsubishi mixers, and that is their intermodulation distortion is way, way lower. Um, they can easily, at one and a half watts out, that thing can be down more than minus 40 dB for your third order is intermodulation. That a or is that a transistor? Huh? You it's a fat. We were talking about trend, uh, fed, oh, the fed, yeah. You said mixer. I'm sorry, the amplifier. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. The Mitsubishi uh, amps are designed for RF, and they yeah they, they can produce a much cleaner output. I sent a link, by the way, the correct link. I I, I messed up. I put a link on the chat for that part at RF parts. Thanks, Kevin. Cool. All right. Well, Pete, thank you so much. You're obviously I have welcome a, to I have, yeah, stay I have with a us, but you got corned beef sandwich right now. <laughs> but I'm always going to say, but you got corned beef sandwich, and you already know all this stuff. But uh, obviously, you're welcome to stay if you want. But uh, everybody, I, uh, thanks, be, thanks I'll so much, Pete. Off. You bet. Thank you, Pete. Anytime. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank Thank you. Thank much. You yeah. Pete. Nice you bet. Bye bye. All right, so now I'm going to turn off the recording. Stop recording. <laughs>